Welcome to Troy First Baptist Church. Here are just a few announcements to add to your calendars. At 6 p.m. tonight, we will have our family game night. We will enjoy time together and families will face off against each other in a trivia game. To sign your family up to join us for tonight, please send Pastor Cameron a text at this number. If you want to, you can text that number right now. If we do not receive a text from you, we will be unable to send you an invitation to join, so make sure to do that. Remember, we will be having a graduate recognition soon. We still need graduates from high school and college that would like to be recognized for this special time. Contact Pastor Cameron at this email. The sooner we have the list of graduates, the better we can prepare for this special day. We want to remind everyone that there are still multiple convenient ways to give tithe and offerings right now. If you will visit our website and click on Give, you will get step-by-step -step directions on how to join the option to give online or through text message. We're excited you've decided to be with us this Sunday. For more information about Troy First Baptist Church, check out our social media pages and check out our website at troyfirstbaptist.net. Here at Troy First Baptist Church, we take a nation and pray for that nation every Sunday. This morning, please take a moment to pray for the country of Cyprus. Think about it, we are in a really crazy time right now. There's no sports, there's no picking up, taking to school, anything like that. It really feels like there's nothing to do. With so much free time on our hands and all of us staying at home, we've found out one unfortunate thing, haven't we? And that there is such thing as too much family time. For every parent and every child right now, no one has ever been home more than they have this past few weeks, past month. And here's the deal, we can either allow the situation to really hinder our moods, or we can take this situation and take this free time and redeem what family time means in the eyes of God. So this is what I wanna encourage you to do, families. Parents, take this time and if you haven't yet, start a family devotion at least once a week. The number one reason why parents don't do family devotions is what? It's because number one, there's not enough time. Well, that's been reconciled for us pretty easily, hasn't it? And number two, it's too hard to get everyone at the same place at the same time. Well, both of these excuses have been thrown out the window during this whole COVID-19 pandemic, and it's taken away all of our excuses to not start a devotion in the home. I know to many of us that may be nerve-wracking to think about what a devotion is, how to do a family devotion, and we're here to help you out with that. Go to our website at troyfirstbaptistchurch.net slash parents, and we've given you a document there to help you not just start, but to thrive in doing family devotions in your own home. I promise you something, with every eye roll from a teenager, from a preteen, or from a child, with every sigh that you get, your children are waiting and longing for you to lead them spiritually where they are. Remember this, the only reason our children will not have family devotions with their family is because that we didn't have them with our children today. So I wanna encourage you, go to our website, download that resource, start family devotions in your family today. Parents, don't be the parents that just raise your children up simply in the idea of Christianity. Be the parents that make a generational change for your children and their children to come. Welcome to Troy First Baptist Church. We're so happy you've joined us today for worship. We just want to give you one more quick reminder about our family game night tonight. If you've ever wondered which Troy First Baptist family is the best, we're going to find that out tonight with our trivia. So make sure to join us tonight, but also make sure to send me that text message with my phone number. Send me that text message or else I will not be able to add you to the invitation for tonight. Uh, but as we begin, go ahead and grab those around you and say a quick prayer.
All right, sing this song with us. Water you turn into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any. Other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God... And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come. Just as you are to worship. Come. Just as you are before your God. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now 
is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Willingly we choose to surrender our lives. Willingly our knees will bow. With all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we gladly choose now come now is the time to worship come now is the time to give your heart come just as you are to worship Just as you are before your God, come, When you're up against a struggle that shatters all your dreams and your hopes have been cruelly crushed by Satan's manifested screams and you feel the urge within you to submit to earthly fears don't let the faith you're standing in seem to disappear praise the Lord he can work Praise the Lord For our God inhabits praise Praise the Lord For the chains that seem to bind you Serve only to remind you That they drop powerless behind you When you praise Him Now Satan is a liar and he wants to make us think that we are paupers when he knows himself we're children of the king so lift up the mighty shield of faith for the battle must be won we know that jesus christ is risen so the work's already done praise the lord he can work through those who praise him praise the lord Habits praise, praise the Lord for the chains that seem to bind you, serve only to remind you that they drop powerless behind you when you praise Him. Praise the Lord, He can work through those who praise Him. Praise the Lord. 
praise the Lord for the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you that they drop powerless behind you when you praise him praise him when you praise him when you Put your books away. We're going to have a test today, says the teacher. And all of the students groan, except for that one student up front who always drove you crazy because he looked forward to tests. Most students groan because they are afraid that the test might be negative. Or the doctor says, I'm afraid we're going to have to take a few tests. And you, the patient, gasp because you're afraid the results might be positive. We all must face tests every day, big or small. So says James in a very interesting letter he wrote, the opening verses of his letter that is now part of the New Testament. He wrote to a people who were in testing, much like we are today. They were hated by the world because they were Jews. They were hated by the Jews because they followed Jesus. They were slandered, persecuted, jobless, homeless, drug into courts. These problems raise for them, as they do for us, many questions. And in chapter 1 of James, we're going to be looking at some FAQ, frequently asked questions, asked in the first century and asked today in the 21st. And among the first is the most pressing, tests. Why do they have to be so hard? In James chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, James will not give some theoretical discourse on the source or the nature of trials, but will give us some very practical advice on what we can do in testing, like we are now as a society, how we can keep on going, especially by focusing on the test results. In James chapter 1, verse 1, he starts, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. This is almost universally recognized as the earliest, most Jewish Old Testament book of the New Testament, written by James to the 12 tribes because at this time, most believers were still converted Israelites. It is so Old Testament that it only mentions the name of Jesus twice, here in chapter 1, verse 1, and in chapter 2, verse 1. But it's helpful for us to know who this James is. Notice how they sign their name up front as opposed to at the end like we do. Very handy to know who you're reading from before you read it. Which James is this among all the James in the New Testament? We would understand the letter better if we knew who he was. You know there were two James in the twelve apostles. There was James the son of Zebedee, the brother of John, and was also James, the son of Alphaeus, sometimes called James the Less. How'd you like that name? Right away, we can rule out James, the brother of John, because we see very early on in church history, he was murdered. He was martyred. Herod killed James, the brother of John, with the sword in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. He was among the first martyrs in the church. Later on in the same chapter, Peter sent to the James and the brethren a different James and tell these to James and the brethren. So who is James and the brethren? We're introduced to him in chapter 15 as a leader of First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. The apostles and elders came together and James was the one who said, listen to me. He's a guy of great respect and authority. We see him in leadership in the Jerusalem council. He's the senior pastor, not Peter. So that's probably this author. Who is he? Paul gives us a clue in Galatians chapter 1. He says, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. 
Not James the son of Alphaeus, James the Lord's brother. Jesus did have a half-brother named James in Matthew chapter 13. He is the second born of Mary. His brothers, Jesus' brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. So he is Jesus' little brother. He's the oldest of the others. So he is probably this pastor, almost certainly the author of the book of James. We also see there is a Jude there, probably the author of the short epistle next to the last book of the New Testament, because he calls himself the brother of James. That's a very humble way of saying also the half-brother of Jesus. The problem is, all that we know of Jesus' physical brothers, at least before his death and resurrection, is that according to John chapter 7, his brothers did not believe in him. Now, we can understand that. What would you think if your brother said he was the light of the world? He thought that was kind of crazy. But something strange happened because after his resurrection, he is now a disciple of, a servant of, a slave of Jesus Christ. Because Paul gives us a clue in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 7, Jesus appeared to Cephas or Peter, then the 12, and then he was seen of 500 brethren at once, as we saw a couple weeks ago at Easter. After that, he was seen by James and then all the apostles. Imagine if your older brother was executed and then you saw him alive. All of a sudden, James, after this, is a different man. So James now finds himself calling himself a servant of God. He'd always been that, but now he's a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine calling your big brother the creator of the universe. Anyone with a sibling, older or younger, knows what a miracle that is. Oh, the stories he could tell. But as a servant, he doesn't use his position as a pastor or as the Lord's brother to lord it over them. He calls them a brother. He addresses them as my brethren. They're hurting, and so he wants to take care of first things first. Let's address the 600-pound gorilla in the room. Your trials, your suffering, the tests. And so he says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. They were in a time of testing like we are today. You can't change the fact that you are in testing, but you can change your attitude towards them. So the first thing I'd like you to notice that James tells them is, I need a changed attitude about tests. He says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. The world gives us several solutions, but none of them are counting it joy. They say, try to solve your problems. Try to escape them or try to ignore them. But if you do, that doesn't solve the problem. There are more problems right behind them. He calls them various trials. Various in the Greek is literally multicolored. That's the same word that is used for Joseph's many-colored jacket. And our trials do come in many varieties, don't they? There's all kinds of relational troubles and physical troubles and financial trials and mental trials and criminal trials. Each one is different. Notice the key word here is when. Count it all joy, not if you fall into various trials, but when you know that it will happen. Pretty realistic, isn't it? The Bible is not the handbook of a televangelist who believes in health and wealth prosperity preaching. The Bible tells us in the world you will have problems. As a matter of fact, it wants us to know that joy is not the absence of problems. The world wants us to solve all our problems, but if you wait for that for joy, you'll never have it. Joy is not the absence of problems. It's actually the presence of Jesus. You can't change the fact that you are in trials. But James wants us to know, I want you to know, that you can change your attitude around them. And it's not just grin and bear it. No, he actually says, don't just wait till it's over. I want you to find joy in those various trials. Pretty incredible. But that's similar to something that James' big brother had said in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 11, and 12, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and they say all kinds of evil things against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Be exceedingly glad when bad things happen. What is this, some kind of masochism? Loving pain and hardship? No, actually it's not. In Hebrews 12, 11, we read, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, 
but grievous. Yes, it hurts. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Yes, it's painful for the present. That's true, but no pain, no gain. So we need to change our attitude towards these tests because we know we don't necessarily enjoy the exercise, but we enjoy the health that the results give us. We don't necessarily enjoy study, but we do enjoy the job or the skill that it gives us. We don't necessarily seek for the pain of discipline, but we want the results of success. We don't necessarily want to do hard work, but we want the clean house. We want the job done. We don't necessarily want chemo, but we do want health. We do want life. We are looking forward to the results. And he calls them here the peaceable fruit. It yields the results of righteousness to those who have been trained in it. James is on to something here, isn't he? Something important, something life-changing. What is most important is not what happens to you, the tests and the trials, but how you react. Think about it. God will not judge you for being quarantined. God won't judge you for being sick, but he will judge you for how you react to that. And the good news is you're not in control of what happens to you, but you're always in control of how you react. So God judges us on the basis of something we have control over. I actually choose my own attitude. So that's something that James wants us to recognize. Take ownership of your life. Take responsibility for your life. Refuse to be the victim under the circumstances, but choose to be a victor over the circumstances. How? First, by understanding the purpose of tests. He says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces results like patience. You ever hear somebody pray for patience? Oh, that's a dangerous prayer request because does God give you patience? No, the only way to get patience is through trials. When you pray for patience, you get troubles. It is a positive thing, though. The testing produces something. A good teacher gives a test, not because he or she has to. A good teacher gives tests not because they want to show how stupid the students are. They want to show how much they've learned. And so a bird does not test its wings to find out what's wrong with them. A bird tests its wings to find out how good they are. And so it should be with us. The purpose is positive, not negative. We have to view them as a source of growth, not a source of discouragement. Every trial is an opportunity to show what we have learned. And Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, that's the purpose, as though some strange thing happened to you. But notice again, rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed... Here's the result. You may be glad with exceeding joy. He says, don't consider it strange. You take a class. What's the object? Not the test, not even the grade, but it's a changed person. And so we need to change our attitude. We need to learn to rejoice in our tests. How? Because we understand the very purpose of tests. The teacher's not trying to trick me. not trying to make me think. The doctor's not trying to make me sick. The doctor's trying to make me better. How can we understand the purpose of tests by experiencing the results of tests? And he says in verse 4, Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. What you have intended in these tests before and what you have experienced after the test makes you perfect and complete. There is no shortcut to success. There is no shortcut to maturity. It must go through the test. So don't pray, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. Endure the trials, learn to grow in them, look at them as an opportunity. As Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 6, in this you greatly rejoice. What, that you have no troubles? No, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by, same words, various trials that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise and honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Don't think that it's strange that you have them and understand there is a purpose to go through the fire. Why would you rejoice by being in fire? When I read this verse, I think of a time a long time ago, B.C., that was before children, 
when my wife and I had time on our hands and hobbies. And one of mine was golf. I used to golf once a week. My wife did pottery. She had enough time to do pottery. And one day after she had spun some pots, she asked me to go put them in the car so she could take them to the pottery place and have them fired. Well, I went in and I just quickly grabbed it by the top. It was a great big jar, about three feet high. I grabbed it by the top and I took a great big piece right out of the top. And I felt terrible. It was so breakable, it hadn't been fired. And so I sheepishly got my wife and showed her my handiwork. And she was remarkably patient and said, that's okay. And she took a knife and she cut off the top and she rounded off the edge. And then she had me very carefully carry it to the car, take it to the oven and have it fired. After that, it was strong enough to use. And I learned something from that. I am like that wet clay that's very breakable before the fire. This is a picture of what God has to allow us to go through. That's what life is for us so that we are not perfect and complete until we are fired. Peter tells us that. James tries to tell us that. Like tea, our best qualities come out in hot water. Like a tea kettle, when we're up to our neck in hot water, we need to sing. We can't change the temperature of the water, but we can change our attitudes. The test will come. It's not if, but when they come. So ask yourself, as a result of this test, am I sad or am I stronger? Am I bitter or am I better? And notice that those things are always your choice. James moves on in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, sometimes these verses are separated from the context. And this is not just new verses about wisdom in general. In context, this is if you need wisdom when you're in trials, if any of you lacks wisdom for the trials you're going through, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Notice the repetition. You are perfect, complete, lacking nothing. But if you lack something, if you lack wisdom, what we find here is the second thing we can do in tests the second test result, we recognize that I need and actually I get caring assistance in tests. You're not left on your own. This is an open book test. You don't understand a question in class. You're supposed to raise your hand and ask the teacher. Well, here I was going to distinguish between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is knowing the information and wisdom is knowing how to use it. But I think we all know that here I want to emphasize wisdom sometimes means knowing enough, learning to ask, not trying to be a know-it-all, do it yourself, but having the wisdom to ask. If you lack wisdom, ask God. And James tells us who to ask. Who should we ask? Let him ask of God. Don't ask the student beside you. That's cheating. Don't ask the patient in the waiting room. Ask the doctor. Ask God, who gives to all liberally, he says. God loves to help. He knows the answer, and he loves to help. He will give to all liberally, and I love this part, without reproach. Without reproach means he won't humiliate you, make you feel stupid for asking. Oh, now you come and ask for help. Actually, in the Phillips translation, it says he won't make you feel foolish or guilty. Or in the Hartman translations, it says he won't make you feel like a jerk. God wants to help us, and if you ask him, he'll give liberally without reproach, and it will be given. He not only tells us who to ask, he tells us how to ask. He says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. Do you ask politely, please? Well, that's fine. Do you ask repeatedly and pestering him? I don't know. Maybe you ask consistently. Do you ask humbly, groveling? No, actually, he says, ask confidently. Ask in faith, no doubting. Don't go to him saying, you wouldn't want to help me, would you? He says, if you ask like that, you will receive nothing. You'd be like a double-minded man and unstable in all of your ways. The teacher wants you to pass, wants you to ask the question. The doctor wants you to recover and get better. So ask. The more tests you take, the more you go through, the more you realize that God is on your side and you have caring assistance. James continues in verse 9, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Again, this is not some new subject. It's related to trials. The lowly, notice not the poor, they're all called brothers. They know they have trials. The rich think they don't have them. 
But the rich and the poor all have trials, don't they? The smart and the not-so-smart students have to take the test. The rich and the poor both are open to the virus. Everyone has to go to the same hospital rooms. So what we need is a little caution. And so here he gives us a third thing we can do when we are in testing, the third test result after testing. I can have a cautious response during, a cautious approach during tests. The key word here is glory. Let the lowly brother glory, that's really the same Back to chapter 1, verse 2, rejoice, glory, rejoice in his exaltation, the rich in his humiliation. The lowly brother knows he's in testing, and the rich assumes that he's not. The rich can thank God for the test to remind you that it will all soon be gone. Here, we are reminded that tests help us learn the advantages of difficulty. Glory in your exaltation. If you are going through trials, if you are having a tough time, if you've lost your job because of the shutdown, if you are in a place of testing, what can you learn? Well, most of our lessons can only be learned in difficulty, right? We can't learn to trust in Him when we don't need Him. We can only learn to trust in Him when we have to. We learn to trust Him when our child is sick, when our job is lost, when money is tight. And it's easiest to focus on eternity when we are in difficulty. People sure seem to be thinking a lot about God in the lockdown, right? It's easiest to focus on God when all is lost. When someone loses their home in a hurricane or a tornado and they say, oh, all is lost, immediately they realize, no, all is not lost. I have my health, I have my family, and we realize, you know, all that stuff is not important. It's not things, but it's people. And we get more perspective, as Paul says in Romans 8.18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, even now, 2020, are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. It's difficult to get perspective and maintain it when everything's going along fine, when we're in comfort, ease, and luxury. But we learn this cautious approach during tests. We not only learn the advantages of difficulty, but the rich learn the dangers of success. So once we are rich, do we glory in our riches? No, glory in our humiliation. Students aren't there just to graduate. You're not just there to graduate. What is it that comes after the test? James reminds us that we can learn the dangers of success, failure and success, poverty and wealth. Both are tests. It's sometimes, though, success and wealth are a greater test than in poverty. Why? Because it's easier to forget God in success, and it is easier to lose focus on eternity in success. If today, like Job in the Old Testament, you've lost it all, you are almost driven to your knees and to pray. You're desperate and you turn to God. But if you have it all, you think you don't need God. You don't desperately turn to God. You're not desperate at all. What do you do with it all? Unfortunately, most of us fail this test. And so he finishes up in verse 12 with a beatitude like his big brother Jesus. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, the same word as we see in verse 2. Trials, verse 3, trials or temptations. Blessed is the man who endures. It's now halfway through the test. The teacher, remember, told you to put away your books and you start filling out the test and you were nervous at first. But now, as we come to verse 12, we realize, you know, I know this. And that's what James is saying here. If you endure, it doesn't mean just grin and bear it. It doesn't mean put up with it. It literally means stay the same underneath. If you can prove true, here is one last very important test result. Yes, we can learn to change our attitude in and about testing, but it's not about the test, is it? It prepares us for something, right? And so we can have a confident achievement from the test. We can gain some test results. When he has been proved, when you've gone through the fire, you are blessed, happy, and joyful. There is a blessing not in the test, but in the accomplishment, in finishing the test, finishing the course, finishing the degree, finishing the job, finishing the training, passing the course. But of course, that does not mean that the tests are over. You finish this test, there'll still be another. There'll be another course. And when you graduate, the test not over. The real life tests get even bigger, right? You are proved and approved for something else. So passing the course is really only preparing for life. The decree is not the work, 
but it prepares you for the work to serve. The doctorate doesn't mean you can put your feet up and relax. It means now you can teach others. Your ordination doesn't mean you can relax. It means you need to minister to others. So that's actually preparing for life. Each test, each test prepares us for the next. So easy tests actually defeat the purpose. The harder the test, the greater the sense of accomplishment, the greater the joy at passing. So the greatest joy is receiving the crown. He says he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. It's not a sense of fulfillment at the finish that's the ultimate goal. It's not the grade on the paper or the approval of the teacher that you're really after. It's not even bragging to your classmates about your A. The most important thing about the test is taking it home and showing your parents, right? And that's pleasing the Father. The crown of life is not a hat. That's not what we're working for, for some headwear in heaven. No, the whole thing is it's to please the Father. And actually, the crown of life could be translated the crown which is life. It's not looking to get a hat to wear in heaven, but it's actually getting eternal life which comes through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. We want you to take these trials as an opportunity to draw closer because we care about pleasing Him because we love him. I know right now, many of you are going through a time of great testing. Maybe you're behind on some bills. Maybe you're worried about your health. Maybe you're worried about your loved ones. James says, I say, Jesus says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Not if, when. And right now we recognize we are in a multicolored trial. But in those trials, don't try to solve them, escape them, or ignore them. Find joy in them with a changed attitude about tests, caring assistance in tests, a cautious approach during tests, and a confident achievement from the tests. Actually, James, Jesus wants you to count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And in the morning, when you take the book, you finish, that's not the test, you put the book away, Remember the teacher said at the beginning, put your books away. We've got a test. This is an open book test. You can go through and you can find what God wants you to do, find guidance there. But ultimately, life is the test. And what results will you gain from it? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for guidance from the letter of James for these times of trial. Lord, we pray for our country. Lord, we pray for our people. We pray that you will keep us safe and healthy. Lord, help us to have a positive attitude. Help us to change our attitude towards trials. And Lord, let us look at them as a source of encouragement, not discouragement. Lord, I pray if there's one who was watching today who's never trusted Christ as their Savior, I pray that these tests might bring them to you. Lord, for those of us who are your children, Lord, would you help us to learn during this trial so we may emerge on the other side not overcome, but overcomers. For in Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you. Tune in next week for another study from the book of James. Again, thank you, church family, for joining us today for worship. We're so happy that you are here with us today. We cannot wait to see your faces tonight through our Zoom trivia family game night. So make sure to be there. Make sure to send myself a text message if you want to, if your family wants to join that. Uh, we cannot wait to see everybody. Remember, youth on Zoom on 530 uh, on Sunday nights, except for tonight. And then uh, Kids Club is going to be 6 o'clock on Wednesdays. And kids, we are excited to say, starting this past Wednesday, that we are, if you've missed the Elevate videos and the Elevate lessons, we are implementing those lessons into our Kids Club on Wednesday nights while we're online. So you can catch up on those and watch those videos. Here are just a few questions to talk about during lunch and apply the sermon to our lives this week. <music> 